Good to go. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, tell everyone uh, thank you for coming to the talk. I appreciate everybody who showed up. Uh, as you can see, the title is uh, Anatomy of a Word Drive or How I Data Mine 28,000 Wireless Networks, and you can too. Uh, this, is, this talk is about a project that I did over this, this summer. Um, well, from early August to late September, as I just stopped collecting data a few weeks ago. Um, over two months of hard work went into this project, so I hope people find it uh, informative and at least a little entertaining. Um, now, who here is unfamiliar with the concept of board driving? Show of hands, other hands, or okay, good, I have a slide on that. Uh, so who the devil am I? Um, my name is Kevin Buchik. I'm a computer science major. My interest kind of spread all over the place, and my projects don't often see completion or the light of day. This is an exception to that rule. Uh, I'm third year at ISD, second talk I've done. Unlike some of the other people who've presented here, um, I don't work in security IT. These are not career goals for me. Messing with this stuff is just my hobby. So my background is protected kind of thing. So um, enough about me. Uh, war driving. For those who haven't heard of it, uh, think of when you first open your laptop and you open the list of wireless networks, the computer shows you the list of networks that it can see. Uh, war driving is basically that, but on a much larger scale. Um, it first appeared in the early 2000s, not too long after the Wi-Fi networks first started to show up, which was about 1999. Uh, the name comes from the earlier concept of war dialing, back, uh, which is back when you had to call servers with a modem using a telephone number. And that involved just like calling every number in like, an area code and prefix, and then logging all the modems that answered for later, often nefarious purposes. Uh, this feat that was featured in the 1983 movie War Games, which is where the name comes from. Uh, it has nothing to do with the concept of actual war, which is often a point of confusion for non-technical people and war drivers like myself try to talk about their hobby. Um, so, when you go war driving, you take a laptop connected to a wireless antenna and a GPS receiver in your car, you drive around an urban area with a lot of Wi-Fi networks, and then you just log all the things. So, um, I did this in Ames over the summer, which was a lot of fun. Uh, time consuming, but I go to DMAX, so that's not a problem. Uh, and also very rewarding, as it was a huge learning experience across a lot of different areas. So um, this talk has two parts. First, I'm going to talk briefly about some of the hardware and software tools I use to collect and analyze this stuff. Uh, so if anyone who's interested can go out and do this for themselves, because it's not hard. And then um, I'll dive right into talking about the data itself and share some of the interesting things I found on the airways of the uh, Two pieces of hardware I use in addition to my laptop, which are these are pretty standard stuff for war driving. First uh, is the Alpha AWS 86H uh, USB Wi-Fi adapter, which is uh, it's a really nice tool for any kind of Wi-Fi shenanigans in general. It supports monitor mode, supports packet injection, uh, it plays really nice with Backtrack Linux, which I use for most aspects of this project. Um, an external wireless adapter isn't strictly necessary, but it will greatly extend the range uh, over your, what your laptop's internal wireless card can do. Plus, you can easily stick it on the roof of your car, which is something that you want to do because your car is basically a Faraday cage, and it will shield an in, in, in internal antenna from picking up exterior radio signals. Uh, second piece of hardware I used was the, the Global Fat MD100 uh, GPS dongle. And this can easily just be swapped out for a smartphone that's connected over Bluetooth or anything that will let your computer get GPS data. Uh, again, it's not totally necessary, but it will greatly increase the value of the data you're collecting because without GPS coordinates, you ain't mapping it. Um, that's what the setup looks like, duct tape to the top of my car. I need to get an egg tank and kind of know if I need to uh, Cables just connect to the back laptop in the back seat. You know, I just shut the door on them to hold them in place. I had to set this up every time I went out, and I got pretty good at it. I can do it in like less than two minutes now. So uh, if you saw a silver car with this crap on the roof driving around town in the last few months, well, yeah, there you know. I got some as far as software goes, uh, the programs I list here are what I personally used, and everything is interchangeable for other stuff that does the same thing, same goes for hardware. But uh, that said, the stuff here is, is pretty powerful, and it plays really nice together. And then all, all, all the custom tools that I wrote for 
uh, this project were designed to be compatible with these formats. Um, so for the actual word driving and a good part of the analysis, I did everything in uh, Backtrack Linux, which is running under a virtual box uh, virtual machine. Backtrack is excellent because uh, it comes with pretty much everything you need already set up. You might have to install GPSD, but uh, I think everything else is, is there. The first thing you'll do before uh, every time you go out driving is you use a tool called Airmon NG to put your wireless device into monitor mode. Uh, Airmon is part of the Aircrack NG suite of tools, which are really useful for <coughs> testing the security of your life network. Well, uh, Aircrack is useful for a bunch of stuff, but monitor mode is one of those. Uh, I'll talk more about that later. Uh, GPSD is a Linux driver for uh, GPS devices that just it starts up a local server on your on your machine and then other programs can hook onto that. It's configured to start by default uh, when you connect in a GPS device and then it just runs in the background. I prefer to disable that in the time phase and then start it with that command because it makes error checking a lot easier because you can see the data stream. Kismet is probably the most important program in this list. It's what you'll use to actually gather data. Um, just start it up when you have GPSD running. You tell it what network interface to listen on, which is usually non-zero with this. Uh, and then you're off. Kismet will take care of logging all the packets and networks that it picks up. It up with nice XML files describing that. And then uh, it also saves uh, PCAP files from the, from the raw packet data. Um, yes, Kismet is a Perl script that also comes with Backtrack that someone wrote that will um, parse the XML files from Kismet into SQL, an SQLI database, which can be easily query. It also allows you to generate KML files based on uh, queries. And uh, if you don't know, KML is a keyhole markup language. It's the format used by Google Earth and other mapping software for rendering place marks. So uh, this is what I use to generate all the, the maps I'm going to show you a little later on. And the uh, two commands up there just take a NetXML file from Kismet, database it, and immediately generate a KML map of all the networks uh, from that run. Google Earth and SQLite Studio <coughs> are pretty self-explanatory. Earth is for doing KML files, and SQLite Studio is uh, the best free Windows app I could find for handling uh, SQLite databases. <coughs> and finally, I wrote a huge mess in Bash, Bash and SQL and Perl code to help analyzing the data, some of which I'll be releasing on my GitHub and probably up there. Uh, so Kismet gives you a lot of data you can work with. Um, specifically, for every network it detects, you'll get uh, the ESSID or network name, BSSID, which is the MAC address of the, of the router, um, and that's how the, all the software determines which access points are actually unique, because a lot have the same name. Um, description algorithm, views uh, the router's manufacturer, the channel it's running on, whether it's broadcasting the SSID or not, uh, min, max, and average signal and noise values, min, max, and average latitude, longitude, and altitude coordinates, and then also like the number of clients connected to the router and the MAC addresses. Um, sometimes you'll be able to get the, IP, the default gateway IP address of the router, uh, some, although Kismet can't always figure this out. I think it requires an open network on the internet for sure. Um, finally, Kismet also saves the data from every single packet it captures, along with the GPS coordinates of where it came from. Most of those are going to be encrypted. You'll only be able to see them if they're from an open network or a web network from which you have the key. Uh, Kismet actually has a nice feature. You can give it a list of web networks, like their MAC address and the key, and it will decrypt those for you. Feel free to stop me if anyone has any questions. Um, so, uh, for anyone who's interested in uh, doing this for themselves, there's a couple of useful tips I can pass on. First, make sure you put your wireless interface into monitor mode beforehand, and <laughs> if your laptop's internal hardware doesn't support it, get an adapter that does. Um, monitor mode will uh, it will allow you to detect all networks, including ones that aren't beaconing their that aren't broadcasting their SSID. It lets you capture all the packets rather than just beacon packets, and then you can mine if they're oh, from an open network. You can mine those for interesting stuff later. Um, also, it's completely passive, meaning your antenna won't send out packets. It won't try to connect to anybody's network, and it puts you on pretty safe legal ground if you happen to run into any problems. Uh, second, when you're trying to capture data. Um, 
try and keep your speed around 20, 15, 20 miles an hour or less. Don't go over 25 miles an hour or you're liable to miss a lot of stuff, especially in uh, higher density areas. Um, the way that Kismet works is by sequentially scanning each channel for traffic and then spend slightly more time on the common channels 1, 6, and 11, although you can actually customize how it's scanned in great detail and config. If you're going too fast, you can easily go in and out of range of the network uh, before Kismet even switches to the channel it's broadcasting on. I found the best times to more drive are on uh, <coughs> after 8 p.m. Although Saturday and Sunday afternoon as well too. Uh, since you'll, you, you're trying to drive slower, if you want to deal with as little road traffic as possible, uh, avoid rush hour for obvious reasons. More driving during rush hour is not fun. Uh, high internet traffic, not so important, because you'll be able to detect most stuff anyway, but if you're after like the hidden networks or just after raw packet data, Driving when people are going to be online, uh, that might help you out a little. If you're trying to thoroughly cover an area, or uh, as I did an entire city, uh, plan ahead of time where you're going instead of just winging it. Um, if you don't want to do it in one run, break it up into sections so you don't have to keep going back to cover streets that you missed, which is really obnoxious. Um, unless you have a photographic map of your, the area in your head, I highly recommend that you use the secondary GPS in your car for navigation and you use the two overhead views so you can clearly see the area you're trying to get. Um, if you don't have one in your car, you can easily, and you have a smartphone, you can use that as your data source over Bluetooth and then just have a map up at the same time on your dashboard or whatever. Um, Busy major streets like Lincoln and Duff are kind of a bad place to capture data. If you're going to be going fast, there's traffic. Uh, so use them to get where you want to go and then go to side, go down side streets to get your data because that's, uh, you can drive slower there and obviously should drive slower there. Uh, parking lots are especially important for getting things like apartment complexes, which are gold mines for wireless traffic because the public road probably won't get you too close to that. and. Um, Pick up very much. Uh, finally, make sure your GPS is locked onto your location and Kismet can talk to it before you start driving. Uh, using GPSD with the command I gave earlier is good for that because you can see the, the live data stream before you go out. Uh, the, the first time I went out to get stuff for this project, I um, uh, when I went to import the data afterward, I found that there wasn't any map data attached to it because the whole time I was driving, I wasn't visible to enough satellites for my location to be calculated. So I had to do the entire campus town area a second time. And now that's why I always uh, mount the receiver on top of the car with the wireless antenna so I don't lose signal. All right, so talk about the project at the heart of this presentation, which I've done the great aim for more driving in 2013. This was my attempt to map as many access points as possible and aims as I could by driving down every public road in town. Um, I didn't quite make it down every road, but that wasn't for lack of trying, but I think I did pretty well. Logged 27,832 individual networks across Ames, which is about 2.1 for every resident, a little more than I thought there would be. Um, this took 21 individual driving runs to collect, started on August 12th, and decided to stop as opposed to finished on September 30th. Uh, according to a, a script that I wrote to extract timestamp data from the logs, I spent a total of 26 hours, 11 minutes, and 14 seconds collecting data for the project, which uh, is about an hour and 15 minutes per run. I could figure out how to get myself to spend as much time on class projects as that. That would be cool. That's still an open problem. <laughs> Uh, because graphs are fun, here's a quick overview of how the data set was constructed over time. The red line shows how many access points were in the database. Uh, at that point, the blue line just shows how many were added. Uh, unsurprisingly, earlier runs generated a lot more stuff than later on. After about like run 12 or so, I was mostly just going back to hit streets and little sections that I missed rather than covering large new areas. Uh, so there's a complete map showing every network in the data set. Not quite every network, but because uh, this Zoom level, a lot of them just cluster together because Google Earth can't draw more than 7,000. I couldn't even use my laptop to take these, this screenshot because Google Earth crashes when you zoom off this far. Google Earth sucks. I'm not a lot of to do that. Um, 
The yeah. color coding is based on encryption. Um, so green dots are WPA2, yellow is WPA, orange is WEP, and uh, red is open with no encryption. No prizes for guessing what the big red blob in the center of the map is. <laughs> uh, try to be as thorough as possible, though I still miss quite a few like tall de sacs and little side streets because there were just so damn many of them and I didn't feel like spending gas money to get one get one block I missed all the way on the other side of town. Uh, I also tried to hit some of the more like obscure residential areas that are around the country, but um, everything on this map has an age address, so there's nothing coming from like Boone or Gilbert or Nevada addresses. It's about Ames. This project is about Ames. Uh, here's what it looks like to again. This is uh, this shows one of the clusters I mentioned there. This is over the campus town area, so you can see like just how densely packed the networks are. There's a lot of data here. Um, if you want to get useful information out of any large data set, statistical analysis is your friend. So let's play with some of that. Um, first, since we like to share it here, encryption. Most common encryption scheme by far, and also the most the, the strongest that you can use on most routers is uh, WPA2 with AES, uh, which comprise nearly 70% of networks, especially in residential areas, like they're almost all green, which is good. Uh, open networks were next at about 19%, although if you exclude the Iowa State network, that slice shrift by quite a bit, about a third or so. Um, followed by the older WPA standard using TK at about 23 and then there's <coughs> using WEF at about 4.5. Or uh, five, five, four, five, um, compare, If you could compare these numbers to older war driving data sets that you can find online, um, it shows a big shift. Even like five years ago, the number of open and web networks in urban areas was a lot higher. Um, this is almost certainly because routers now are generally using WPA2 by default. Because uh, let's face it, a lot of people, even in a college town, aren't going to bother to spend the five minutes needed to configure the network to be secure if it doesn't come that way out of the box. Uh, so look a little closer to open networks because you know they create lots of security holes so it's nice to know where they're coming from. Uh, open networks were pretty evenly split three ways between um, ISU networks at about 35 percent, um, default guest networks at about 25 percent, you know the ones that they're active in some router's default config that uh, they isolate clients from the rest of the, the LAN, and then everything else, plus a uh, small number of HP printers that were open as well. There were a lot of wireless HP printers. Yeah, there were like 400 HP printers, like all of them. <laughs> There's a map of open networks, uh, which shows pretty plainly that like, yeah, the ISU campus forms the densest cluster in the middle, no surprise. Uh, outside of campus, the density of open networks basically seems to mirror population density. Uh, clusters show up in campus town, Somerset, like University West, University Plain, neighborhoods where there's a lot of people. Lower density areas are more sporadic, and as I mentioned on the previous slide, a lot of those are, are default guest networks that aren't exposing much for text internet traffic because no one's using them. Half the time they don't work anyway. Mm -hmm. And just for fun, here's the map of retards <coughs> behind these routers that are really running left still. Um, there's 220 of these guys in town. Pretty even distribution, a um, little bit of clustering downtown, and also there's this line out uh, along Bell Avenue at the east end of town, which is interesting because those are all corporate and industrial networks. Oh. <laughs> um, this is one statistic I'd love to track if I or anybody else repeats this project in future years just to see uh, how much the use of what goes decreases in age over time. And it is decreasing. Channel statistics, for the most part, not too surprising. Uh, channel 6 is the most common at 7,630 networks, followed by 1 in 11 at 7,500 and 7,300, respectively. Um, just over 19% were on atypical channels, meaning not 1, 6, or 11. Channel 2 is the most common, channel 5 is the least common. A uh, few anomalies did show up, though. Uh, about uh, 290, or about 1% of networks, were on channel 0, which isn't a valid Wi-Fi channel. Uh, and I couldn't find much useful information online about it. I tried mapping them, and I couldn't see any other obvious correlations, so, you know. Uh, channels 14, or uh, 12 through 14 exist. They're, they're defined in the 8211 spec, but they're used elsewhere in the world. They aren't allowed by regulation in North America, and US routers don't generally support them. Um, after a little bit of internet research, I found out that networks on 
12 and 13 are permitted in the US as long as they're below a certain power level because those channels spill over into the 2.5 gigahertz frequency band, which is allocated for mobile satellite transmission. Oh. So mm -hmm. I guess that the routers on those channels are probably made by a foreign manufacturer. And uh, right, the routers, uh, at least the three routers running on channel 13 are made by a company called PFM Networks, which is a Korean company. Speaking of manufacturers, uh, yeah, wireless package expos, who made them, who made the access point. Um, lots of Cisco routers, almost a third of them with Cisco routers. Uh, Iowa State largely contributes to this because campus networks run almost entirely on Cisco equipment, and it's pretty easy to tell that just by querying the database. Uh, that covers Linksys routers as well, by the way, because Linksys is, is owned by Cisco, and that's just how much it aggregated it. Um, Netgear and Action Tech are next, about a quarter of the whole. Make up, make up those two, followed by Apple, and then D-Link, and then the Stripey Slice is just everything else, and there were 150 different of those total. This table uh, is the top 15 most common SSIDs. Nothing too surprising, again, with um, three common ISU network names are at the top, followed by some, some default networks, and then uh, APD and ACH Wi-Fi, which are run by the city of Ames. Uh, I'll talk about those later, the map of them is interesting. On the subject of SSIDs, there are some pretty hilarious <laughs> ones out there. Uh, this section is my favorite one to put together because um, some of the things people name their average is just absolutely golden. Um, and al although one can easily find stuff like this in any major city, I think college towns like Ames can have like, a really unique sampling of them because you have a lot of technically capable young people with bizarre senses of humor all the time. <laughs> so uh, there's so many of these, I can't show all of them, but they're my favorite. Hi, Jim. 314, man, bro. There's <laughs> lots of this kind of stuff, just like people talking to their neighbors using their Wi-Fi network. And when I see these, I think like, there has to be a story behind that. And I wish I knew what it was. <laughs> AIDS babies rule. Go AIDS baby. <laughs> <laughs> these guys have some noisy neighbors. Gay <laughs> <laughs> this is from University Village. 
yielded, which uh, in, in, interestingly yielded a lot more creative names than the Highlander <laughs> Village, which in the north, which is mostly like Mary's Two and Emily's, and even more than like Somerset. So interesting point there. It's pretty easy to tell like what parts of games are heavily dominated by undergrads just by looking at how creative or generic like the SSIDs are. <laughs> Another thing I discovered while doing this project was how common certain joke SSIDs were and like, how many of them are actually are out there. Uh, who here has seen networks called FBI surveillance pattern around town? Yeah, not surprisingly, considering there are 59 of them in Ames, and not just FBI, but CIA, NSA, DEA, DE, DHS, and much like a few other three letter agencies. So either Ames is a hotbed of surveillance like, <laughs> <laughs> announce the presence of Wi-Fi, or people really underest overestimate their own creativity. <laughs> no why the science guy is so very common. <laughs> At first, uh, I saw a few of the, these like here and there, and as I gathered more data, I started to wonder, why are these so common? Like, 30 people can't come up with the same joke. Of course, it, it didn't take long to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Reddit repost that leaked off the internet and I'm infecting my research project. Uh, apparently the staff noticed the FBI network too, they're not just in Ames. Hide your kids, hide your Wi-Fi was another common one, and 34 <laughs> networks matching that query. If you don't know what that's a reference to, you don't spend enough time on the internet. <laughs> Fifteen instances of uh, IP hurts one IP on the line. This <laughs> 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 wasn't on Reddit, but it only made somewhere apparently. So the, the point I wanted to make with that section is um, there's this weird but interesting aspect of college town culture that's hidden away in a place where most normal people would never think to look. Namely, the energy of 8 or 2 11 packets to things in the air and for the And if nothing else, this project freezes that piece of culture in time for future researchers who might look at it because remember, Ames is a very dynamic place. A year from now, most of that map will change as the ISU student population changes and people move and it, it will never look like that again. Uh, some other interesting stuff I found. This map shows all of the cloaked networks, or the ones that aren't broadcasting their SSID. Uh, although for some reason, Kismet did pull SSIDs for a few of them. I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, 4.5 of networks were hidden, or about uh, 1,200, 1,200, I think. Mostly spread out. A few clusters show up here and there, like um, uh, North Grand Mall, Mary Greeley Hospital, downtown, and then along South Duff. Um, my guess is that these clusters are mostly private, corporate, or retail networks for employees that are hidden for public view, so it makes sense to find more of them in, in commercial zones. ISU runs a lot of wireless networks, over 2,200 of them, and nothing them reveals where ISU has presence in the city. Um, that's my best guess is as to where those outlying networks off campus are originating from, if you're weird like me, find crap like this intriguing. Uh, the, the KML for this map and the, the query used to generate it is uh, on the, it's in the documentation that I'm releasing with this GitHub, or no, with the data set on GitHub, I'll get to that later. Ames Police Fire and other city services also run wireless networks, which appear in mostly in a few like tight clusters. Um, if you're wondering, APD, Wi-Fi, means Ames Police Department, and ACH is Ames City Hall. Uh, they always appear together wherever there's APD, Wi-Fi, there's also an ACH Wi-Fi nearby. More guesswork as to their origins. Most of them are pretty obvious where they're coming from. If you are kind of weird, if they're not close to any city building, one of those ones, like in the middle of the neighborhood, and then you can by the water park. Yes. Uh, here's something I just thought was like kind of weird. Um, this is on Y Avenue, south of Lincoln Way, out at the far west end of town. And that uh, the green area, is uh, it's an abandoned trailer park, and by abandoned I mean there hasn't been a trailer park there since the 90s, according to Google Earth's historical view. Like you need to go back to 1996 for it to look different than that. Um, most of the the networks here along this stretch of road are like they're over 500, 600 feet from any any building. I know they're not coming from that because that's a farm, and they're not coming from that because that apartment complex I had already hit up previously, so they would have shown up from there. So. This is what I'd expect to see if there actually was a trailer park there, but there, there's not, so I don't know. Um, obviously, there's only many more interesting things that could be said about this data, but only so much, I can only fit so much into a one, well, half hour presentation. Um, instead, I want you guys to find this for yourselves. I've decided to release 
most of this project to the public. Something which at first I wasn't sure exactly how I had I would handle it. Like, should I keep it? Should I charge people for it? Because it was expensive to collect. But I figured out you know, people would just think I'm a dick if I didn't release it for free. Uh, decided no, knowing other people were looking at using this stuff is more important to me than any money. So uh, if you go to github.com slash kimbuchik slash uh, driving slash data sets, and it's linked up on the slides, um, you can find this under Ames 2015 final, I think it's called. And uh, there will be a few smaller data sets I'll be putting up there as well. Uh, I've already done Gilbert. Uh, I might do Boone in the near future. Boone's a bitch. It's just a giant grid of mostly residential, like easy to, to do, but boring. Um, so I've uploaded the SQL I database files, several pre-made KML maps, and if you want to generate more, just go download get Kismet and start running queries. Um, and then a few of the raw, the raw XML data from Kismet. And then um, the only thing I really omitted from that was the, from the releasing are the, the PCAP dump files of the packet data, because those might contain some personal information maybe. If you've been following the news, you'll know that Google's recently gotten into a bit of hot water for uh, databasing the data they pulled from open network from their street view cards. Um, Red cookie cadre on the stuff, haven't found any session cookies, nothing, no social security numbers, but meh. Um, I can look at that more. Also, if you look under scripts in the same repository, I've uploaded five Perl scripts that I wrote for this project for analyzing Kismet data, including my statistics aggregator, which just runs like dozens of SQL queries on the database, counts the results, calculates percentages, and builds top 10 lists. So if anyone else does board driving, uh, you can check some of the stuff out. It might make your life easier. And uh, yeah, all this is documented on GitHub in the review files. Um, finally, I will also be, I haven't done this yet, I will be uploading all the access points I've collected to the LIGO project with uh, LIGO.net, which is basically a database, global database for war driving data that has stuff going back to like the early 2000s. Um, not terribly, not as easy to query <coughs> as my database, but, um, and the stuff in Ames wasn't as complete, but I'll be putting all this on there. So uh, now that I've thrown all that stuff at you and given you the data set to play with, uh, here's a few ideas for taking this project further. Try war driving in your hometown or your neighborhood if it's a larger city. Um, use the scripts I've released on GitHub, extract some stats, and compare them with this data set. I'd be really interested to see how things like recurring SSIDs, encryption, manufacturer stats from this, from AIMS, compare with other cities. Um, as far as AIMS goes, I wouldn't recommend anyone try doing this in what I did, at least until next year when the student population cycles again and people move, but uh, I do want to do it again and if we could get like a bunch of people gathering data instead of just me, we could easily cover AIMS in like a week or two instead of months and just split up the town and have one person in the section. Um, and then we can look at how much things have changed when we're in the future, like how many access points from this have disappeared, how many are new, how many are still around under a different uh, SSID, like for people selling their routers or something, uh, in addition to comparing with all those sets in this talk. Also, um, the way Kismet places networks on the map really kind of sucks. It just uses the packet with the highest signal strength as the location of the access point, and uh, that's why every point on, my, on the map is on a road, because that method isn't going to place a data point somewhere I didn't actually drive. Um, this is actually something I'm working on right now because Kismet, since it logs the coordinates of and the signal strength of every packet it receives, there are several different methods and algorithms out there for estimating the location of a radio source that we can use instead. Uh, things like triliteration. Uh, I read a really interesting paper where this, these researchers uh, took war driving data and they generated like a vector field from all of the uh, packets and calculated the gradient of that vector field to find where the access point was. Like, I want to implement that. That could, knowing where the stuff is, can make the data, a lot, the map, a lot more interesting. And finally, uh, it goes without saying that there is far more crap using the electromagnetic spectrum than just one five. And um, software-defined radio receivers can be had for like 10, 20, 30 bucks for the cheaper ones. And there's already Kismet plugins out there for uh, sniffing Bluetooth, doing spectrum analysis on a range of frequencies, etc. Uh, I'm considering maybe doing my next ISG talk on that topic because 
SDR is fascinating, and Wi-Fi is just the tip of the iceberg for war driving. Ooh, uh, so, finish up here. Um, the best ways to reach me are uh, either my Gmail address or Skype. Uh, there's my GitHub account again. Go download this data, play with it. Uh, if you find something interesting and you have questions, please hit me up. I'd love to hear what you think. Um, also, I'm unemployed right now, so if you, anyone knows someone who will hire me as a code monkey or IT guy, I'd appreciate that. I need a job. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's about it. Questions? Yeah. So you captured a kind of an interesting plan because that's when everybody's moving. It might be kind of I know. interesting to see if we can track. Um, I, yeah, I started on August 12th, and it happens in like two phases. Most leases expire at the beginning of August, August 1st. It was, I, I had just moved before doing this. I, I would have liked to do it at a better time, but um, I actually, I did not hit campus until the beginning of the semester when most other people had moved in. Um, so the data set should be pretty clean, but yeah, that, that's a good point. I, I would have rather done it in the summer completely. Right, I think it would be interesting to do two captures, one maybe a month earlier than we that's, started. And yeah, that's originally after. what I was going to do, but I realized, like, holy shit, Andrew's huge, there's no way I'm going to be able to do this, and just me doing it, and I'm on. Um, everyone else I talked to, like, a lot of people were really interested when I told them what I'm doing, but they were like, I don't have time to do that. So. What? Oh, so, um, I actually tried that. I did the, uh, a small list of them in the Alchemy API, and um, the results weren't that interesting. I think the lack of spaces kind of screws it up. They're not very complete. Um, something could, I'm sure, yeah, I, I, I thought about that. Um, Something can be done there. There's just like the strings just aren't long enough for, for their, their neural network to pick up much. Yeah, I mean, I guess along that lines, if, if you can somehow identify when people are talking to each other, you can go back and try to take a whole conversation or something like that. I mean, there's just <laughs> not enough there. Right. <laughs> there, 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 there's this stuff I see like Hot Girls in Apartment 7, that one's on uh, Sheldon. <laughs> just random stuff that obviously like there's there's context there. Like, I wish I knew more about what the context is. Uh, 
just couldn't let to do that. And um, I couldn't, I, I stopped doing it on my own computer. I used uh, web server at the, the lab I used to work for in the biotech department I still have access to. Because um, it was taking, like, to generate all the KML files, it was starting to take, like, two hours, three hours to do on my laptop each time I wanted to, this time I did a new run. So I'd, I'd love to have a program. And I know there are GIS programs out there to do that, but they're really expensive, and I don't feel like they're in them. If anyone, um, Wants to come to the hangout afterward? I'll have the map and database available for people to play with. Uh, I won't be there, there till seven, but I need some money.